Hey, Inside Crypto fans, we're back with the latest episode of Bitcoin Weekly, and boy, there's a lot to talk about today. Bitcoin dropped to just under $60,000. It's recovered a little bit, roughly sitting about $61,000 at the moment. Mt. Gox redemption fears overblown, say traders, as 10 billion BTC holdings draw concerns. Investors' interest surges for Bitcoin miners following core scientific AI hosting deal. This is from JP Morgan, a reporter on By the Block. The evolving Bitcoin landscape. The evolving Bitcoin layer landscape. This is from Bitcoin Magazine. Our second to last story is Net Zero Company secures a $5.5 million seed for blockchain based carbon removal token. And the last story for today is by Nomura Connects. Our global economic outlook charting different courses. We're going to talk about the US, talk about Asia, we're going to talk about Europe as well. Let's dive straight into the Bitcoin price. So as of the time of recording, Bitcoin currently at $61,323.06, up 0.7%. We've seen it in the range of $59,000 to $61,000 at the moment. There's a lot of reasons. One of the reasons we'll talk about just in a few minutes is Mt. Gox said roughly about 24 hours ago that, yes, this is the month where we are going to start to repay people back their Bitcoin, roughly about $9 billion or $10 billion, depending who you talk to. So that is a lot of Bitcoin. And of course, um, a lot of traditional investors, people who might have bought Bitcoin ETFs, they'd be like, oh my God, like when these people get their Bitcoin, they're going to sell it because they bought Bitcoin a long time ago when Bitcoin was really cheap. Other people have made different arguments. We'll dive into that in just a bit. So as usual, there's always the, the narrative of, oh, okay, now's the time to buy the dip. You guys should do your own research because, again, none of this is financial advice. And with that being said, let's not waste any time and jump into today's first story. So as I hinted to a minute ago, Man Gok's redemption fears overblown, says traders. And one of the big reasons people say this is overblown is just because since the Man Gox ha happened in 2014, people have had the chance to sell their Bitcoin or sell the rights to their Bitcoin. Again, similar to what happened with FTX, is when FTX went bankrupt, and now that the crypto markets have recovered somewhat, we're in a quote-unquote bull market, or we're recovering, depending who you want to believe, people have come and say, yes, if you want to sell your FTX rights, we will buy them from you, so if you needed money, you could do that. And the same probably went for Mancox. That's what people have said. I don't know any bundle. I haven't read anything to that effect, but yes. If you really needed money from 2014 to now, 10 years later, you could have sold it, you could have found some way to get rid of those rights. And, and then if you haven't gotten rid of those rights, if you're buying Bitcoin, if you're seeing the positivity around crypto when it comes to Bitcoin and Ethereum and some of the altcoins, you're probably likely to keep your Bitcoin. And again, not likely to sell. So that's one of the reasons, as according to today's CoinDesk story, which is it is overblown. So some key points from the article, traders believe the selling pressure from Mt. Gox repayments might be less severe than anticipated, potentially easing concerns about an immediate sell-off. Galaxy research suggests that a significant portion of the distributed Bitcoin may not be immediately sold, as most will likely be held by creditors due to their low cost of basis. So if you know anybody who was a Mt. trader or who was holding Bitcoin in Mt. please let me know, comment down below. I'd love to hear their story. I'd love to do a podcast and maybe interview them. That would be interesting. Today's next story, investor interest surges for Bitcoin miners following core scientific AI hosting deal, JP Morgan. One of the things we know about is that the Bitcoin reward has had right now 3.125 Bitcoins. So roughly at today's price, that's $180,000 if you get a Bitcoin block and you get the Bitcoin reward, which is fantastic. It's a decent amount of money, but most of these rewards are going to those big, massive miners out in Texas or out in some of the renewable places in the world. And they have a high cost. If you go back to a few podcast episodes ago on Bitcoin Weekly, we talked about some people were mining one Bitcoin at a cost of $74,000 per Bitcoin. So they would need Bitcoin to be above $74,000 in order to make a profit, which is, yeah, that's a lot of money. So what a lot of people have doing, even Ethereum miners as well, is there are ways for you to sell your GPU compute power so that you can earn money again. With all the, the four around AI research and especially AI models and LLMs, large language models, you need more time to train your models. Go back to the last week's story, we talked about this. It makes sense that traditionally, if you wanted to build your own server farm, you're buying a location, you're building or you're renting out a server farm, and it is expensive. Costs have come down, but it's still somewhere around $30 million to train a large language model, something similar to ChatGPT 3.5. 
Turret 4.0, Claude is at 3.5. Gemini is still Gemini. We don't know what version Gemini is. So this is really interesting because this could cut down on the Bitcoin hash rate, which means there'd be less Bitcoin blocks produced in theory, which could be a good thing maybe. But then, then the other side of that is that less hash rate means the, the network is less secure. So it's interesting that some of these miners, and I was trying to figure out, are they using ASIC Bitcoin miners to help out with log language models? No. So I think what they're referring to, and correct me if I'm wrong, if you're watching this video, let me know, that they're using the infrastructure. Because if you are setting up these Bitcoin mining farms, larger scale Bitcoin mining farms, then you do need large amounts of power. You need power infrastructure, you need cords and wiring, and you need engineers to work there. You're looking at a 20, 30, 100 person operation. And I guess this is what people are, are investing in, which is, okay, get rid of your Bitcoin ASIC miners, set up some GPUs, and then we're good to go. And then we're renting on our servers for people like Meta and Facebook. And there's also Mistral, which is another open source solution. So this is really interesting and it could be a good thing or maybe a bad thing for Bitcoin, but I'm looking forward to hearing about that. All right, so today's next story is the evolving Bitcoin layer landscape. So we've talked about this on the podcast. The 21 Shares Analyst Call has talked about this, that Bitcoin is becoming more than quote unquote digital gold. And a lot of people have suggested this, that in order for Bitcoin to really thrive and the price to really you know, go up, not financial advice, that you need Bitcoin to be more than just Bitcoin. It has to be... NFTs, it has to be ruins, it has to be ordinals, it has to be all this sort of stuff. And Bitcoin has evolved through that. We know El Salvador has been using the Lightning Network. And if you go to El Salvador, you can pay for coffee with Bitcoin at Starbucks. So this is really interesting. They're talking about side chains and the possibility of Bitcoin becoming more than what it is, like becoming a layer for DeFi. And side chains run in parallel to the Bitcoin chain. And again, correct me if I'm wrong. So a lot of the problems with this is that as you develop these side chains, as you develop these other layer solutions, is that they're splitting up Bitcoin. And it comes down to the Ethereum layer two situation, whereas you have Manta, you have Luna, you have Optimism, you have Arbitrum, and all these different solutions and all the liquidity is fragmented, which is never good. Because fragmented liquidity equals higher prices and just a terrible experience for people overall. So if Bitcoin does split up and, and does move toward the Ethereum ways, what happens? Check out the article, let me know, and let's move on to today's next story. Net Zero Company secures 5.5 million seed for a blockchain-based carbon removal token. Uh, leveraging blockchain technology, the CRT offers accessibility, transparency, and traceability in the market for verified carbon credits. So this is a Swedish company founded in 2022. So why I thought this story was interesting is that when it comes to crypto and blockchain technology, a lot of people, and again, speaking to people in the crypto space, the blockchain space, in the crypto industries, yes, people believe the technology, but people don't believe in tokens. They don't believe in the Uni token or the Aave token or something like that. Yes, we believe in it, but a lot of the other stuff is quote unquote scammy. So to have another company raise money in five and five million dollars in 2024 is, is a fair amount of money. That is fantastic. So what does this company do? NetZero's company's introduction of its carbon removal token addresses the projected need for at least 3 billion tons of carbon removals by 2030. Key features of the CRT include security, certified carbon removal projects backed by a comprehensive replacement plan to ensure the integrity and protection of carbon removals. Transparency developed on the Ethereum blockchain, the CRT provides verifiable proof of environmental impact, enhanced credibility and accountability. Traceability. Each CRT represents a ton of sequestered carbon dioxide from diverse nature-based projects with full traceability through blockchain technology. Accessible. Through the CRT, anyone anywhere can purchase carbon removals, climate action for accessibility. So this is really interesting and I think this is fantastic. And though I think this is not new, I believe there was a, a DAO on, on Polygon, Climate DAO, which is doing carbon removal, but I think the, the problem that I have found with a lot of these companies, not, not about the blockchain technology, is that the technology works and you can see it, it is the blockchain, so you can see it, you can participate in it, but it depends on the company and how they've organized it, how reliable it is, who are they working with, what projects are they doing, what is the accountability on their side, are they going to check out these projects, how do they ensure replaceability when things like that happen. It all comes down to the company and if they have a robust system in place to make sure everything works and it runs well and it runs efficiently, wonderful. 
If they don't, then you're still wasting money and not really saving the environment. Now the Nomura Global Economic Outlook. Again, we're focusing on the U.S. It says, it says the U.S. economy has performed better than other developed markets particularly those in Europe, most developed markets saw mild recessions of slow growth in late 2023 in the wake of the pandemic. Meanwhile, the U.S. continues to grow at or above trend. As a result, the Federal Reserve is currently primarily focused on inflation, and Nomura's view is that the Fed is going to cut rates twice this year in September and December, said Dave Bitsif, the firm's chief development markets economist. Now, this is interesting because the Fed himself came out and, and, and said they haven't definitively said, but most people are expecting just a single rate cut this year. All right, let's have a look at Europe. Unlike the US, GDP and consumer spending in Europe has been weaker compared with pre-pandemic levels, said George Buckley, chief European economist. Long-term economic growth expectations may be hampered by climate change, demographics, deglobalization. Again, we know the European Union and China are arguing about electric vehicles and tariffs and so forth. That's going to be interesting. And let's move on to Asia. The export cycle in Asia, which has been in recovery for the last nine months, will continue to boost Asia's growth outlook. Last year's semiconductor-driven export recovery continues, and the region is now seeing the export recovery broaden out to include other sectors such as chemicals, shipbuilding, and autos. Alongside domestic demand, this should support overall growth in Asia. So, right, of course, semiconductors, NVIDIA, not to mention NVIDIA, Samsung, Japan as well, they're making panels. So Japan, Taiwan, South Korea, we've all been doing really well when it comes to exports because people keep buying electronics. AI still is a thing and is not going to disappear anytime soon. So that is really interesting. I hope you guys enjoyed today's stories. I know it's been a while. We had a good time testing out different sort of video formats and we'll see how this one goes. Please comment down below. Don't forget to share and subscribe. And don't forget to click on this video over here for more videos like this and see you guys later.